vacuum flux. If you're in quantum mechanics, they shift the zero point energy if you're in continuous wave theory. Whatever they do, they shake up the troops in this space. Whatever space is out there, that's what's perturbed. And at the same time, the nuclei, having positive charges, are going in the opposite direction, equal momentum, much less distance because they're highly damp because of the large mass, but they deliver equal amount of energy to the perturbation of the vacuum. So the vacuum, medium, whatever it is, gets a wave of expansion, the two pushing apart, and the two coming together. That's what Tesla called his expansion rarefaction wave. It's just like a sound wave, and that's exactly what it is. It is an electromagnetic sound wave. But of what? What's shaking? I'm going to show you in just a moment. Next slide, please. Well, then comes along, because in, in electrodynamics, you see, we still assume the material ether. We still teach it at every university in the United States, including right here in Seattle. Never changed. Still in all the equations. Do you remember when your professor told you that at each and every point in space there was a unit point coulomb of charged mass, there was a unit uh, north pole of magnetically charged mass, and there was a unit kilogram of mass sitting at each and every point in space? Man, that's a lot of mass in space. You mean that empty stuff out there has got mass like that everywhere? And what the equations describe is how those unit masses and unit charges move if they were there, which they are not there. But they are still assumed to be there. So this shaking thing, there's never been an electric field in a vacuum, never will be. This has been well known since 59, been pointed out before then, but accepted since 59. But it never changes electrodynamic teaching. There's never been an electric field in the vacuum. There's never been a magnetic field in the vacuum. There never will be because they're force fields and they require all those point coulombs and those point unit masses and the Michelson-Morley experiment killed those dudes in the late 1880s. Killed them dead in the macro. And what did the electrodynamicists say? Now, I got sympathy for those fellows. I'm not just, I'm being a little funny, but I'm not really condemning those guys. They had a formidable job. There was only about three dozen of them in the world at the time. And what they said, fine, they wound up this way. Okay, if we don't have an ether, a material ether, we're not using one. They never changed a single equation. They never eliminated the material ether from the equations or the assumptions of the material ether. And every school in the Western world is still teaching that same old material ether that went down the tubes 110 years ago. Now, how long is it going to take our guys to change something they already know and admit is wrong? Another 100 years? Maybe. Next slide. Here's the definition, the way they define it. The field, the uh, potential, the scalar potential, common old voltage in the vernacular, it ain't even a scalar entity. 1903, Whitaker showed that it's just made of a bunch of longitudinal wave pairs. Hey, longitudinal wave pairs, a wave going one way and its phase conjugate going the opposite way. It's time reverse twin. It's anti-wave, wave anti-wave anti pairs. The thing is a multi-wave entity, and so a multi-vectorial entity. It ain't even a scalar entity. But it's called a scalar entity. Now, what is scalar is the amount of energy that an intercepting point coulomb is. If you stick one out there, it diverges the fluid flow around it, and so these waves all have to diverge around it, and the amount of energy in that divergence at that point is considered to be the magnitude of the potential. Ain't no such thing. They're the magnitude of how much energy is diverged out of the potential. They have nothing to do with the magnitude of the potential. By the way, let's reason together. If I have the tiniest of flashlight batteries and it puts out one quarter of a volt, and it puts out one uh, milliamp, how much energy can I draw from that little bitty battery, the potential that's in that battery? How much would you like? 
Would you like six times ten to the trillionth power joules? The formula, ladies and gentlemen, in ordinary electrodynamics is phi Q. Phi is the potential. Q is how much collecting charge you have. And the amount of energy you can collect from that depends on how much Q you got. If you got a little bitty, bitty, bitty bit of voltage, just add enough Q, and every single bit of charge will collect its little piece of energy, and it'll just keep adding as you add more charge. So from any finite non-zero uh, voltage or potential, you can, in theory, collect any amount of energy you wish to collect. And we are not allowed to do free energy? Oh, come now. Let us reason together. Next slide, please. So the fundamental definitions got wrong. Well, they got worse. They went from there to worse. Here's a common little old circuit. Remember, this was put together as fluid flow. Now, <clears throat> I'll come back to how much energy is really going here. There's about 10 to the 13th times as much energy flowing in this circuit as what we normally are taught to calculate in our university courses. And we'll show you how that got changed and thrown away. <clears throat> what we do is the electrons, we put a potential on the electrons on the top wire, the potentials are higher and so the electrons are energetic and there's a more on the back end than on the front end so that's a gradient and that's an E field and it pushes the electron forward and in the model they use where the electrons actually go ahead and travel on through the circuit actually the energy pushes on down to the succeeding electrons uh, we go through the resistor and they lose their little potential and the banging and clanging and they shake off some fields we call he heat now, when they get down to the bottom, they got none of those extra potentials left, like the Cajun says. They don't exhaust it all of that. They don't got nothing pushing them. So they're just hanging there like so much residue. But now your problem is, the way we're taught to build circuits, you got to push that little dude now that's hanging in the middle of your way all the way across that bottom line back to this battery here that I show on the left. And you've got to shove him back up all the way through against the back EMF, banging and clanging and knocking the source particles every which way. Well, it turns out that half of the energy <laughs> that's delivered to the circuit has to take him back up to kill the dipole. And the thing furnishing the energy is not the battery at all. It doesn't furnish nothing to the circuit. There's no work on the circuit at all. Sorry about that, but it's true. What the battery does is when you... Fools that we are when we build this circuit and we run the current back through the back EMF, we destroy the dipole, which already we know from particle physics for 40 years has been pulling energy out of the vacuum and running it freely down the wires. We destroy the gusher that's furnishing the energy to run the circuit. We kill the gusher. Strangle that dude. And so what we have to do, the, the chemical energy in the battery then has to do some more work on some more charges to bring them back together and restore the dipole so it can pour out some more energy. And what we do is we have a big old sumo wrestling match right there, and we kill that thing as fast as it forms. And since we kill it with half the energy that came out of the vacuum for free, the, other, the best we could ever get is half left in the circuit, and that's one-to-one. -one. That's 100%. That would be superconductivity. And so damn fools that we are, we have to keep putting all the energy in there to get anything down through the resistor at all. And that's what we teach every electrical engineer in the country to do. And it's really that simple. Next slide. We'll show you some more here. Now, boy, we have been trained now with very clever artwork and artful dodging to teach all our electrical engineers and many of our electrical physicists that power and rate of energy flow are the same thing. So when they talk about batteries furnishing power and generators furnishing power, power is not furnished to the circuit. Power develops in a component that's scattering something like a resistor, for example, or changing the form of the energy. No generator and no battery furnishes any power anywhere. Now, energy, that's a different thing. But what we did, if you look at the energy flow, which was added after Maxwell by Poynting and Heaviside, Poynting, who got the name for it because he published in the Prestige 